Good, thanks. A couple really quick announcements. Um, I don't know what that is. Ladies, the um, women's event is coming up super soon. It's the end of July already. can't believe this year is almost up. We're more than halfway through. Um, it's like three weeks away. It's going to... It'll probably be here. I don't know how many have RSVP'd. You should if you haven't. Um, it's, I do. Is it September or August? September. All right, I lied. I lied. It's not three weeks. It's seven weeks away. So you got, you got some time. My bad. It's all right. You know. But either way, you guys, if you haven't RSVP'd, do. Um, reach out to Teresa. She's the one that sits up here. Kurt's wife. She's the one playing the drums. Or reach out to my wife. Um, let them know you want to come so we can put your name down. It's not about how many people are coming. It's about us knowing what to pre uh, prepare for. If there's 10 people, we'll prepare for 10. If there's 30, we'll prepare for 30. Typically, there's about 30 women that show up. Um, I know you've never been to one because, well, you're new here. And I know several of you other ladies haven't been to any of these. These are really cool events. I'm really jealous of the ladies, the way they put these events together. They're just really well done, well, well rehearsed, well, well versed. And this place doesn't even look like this place anymore. It looks nice. Doesn't look like you're in the hood. That, serious. Doesn't even look like you're in the hood anymore. You like walk out and from the ghetto into like this little pearl. It's really cool. I'm not kidding. Like ask the girls. Like you, it, this whole place changes. Like they do all their girly stuff and it's incredible to see. And then it's just a great time of fellowship, of teachings, of worship, and whatever it is they do. And there's always great food because usually I'm the one that cooks it. <laughs> but, you know, um, seriously, they're free events. That's what they cost. Nothing. Your time. Come. Ladies, if you know anybody that wants to come, let them know. We want to invest into anybody that wants to be invested in. That'll be September 14th, 2024. Well, I just explained to them. If you don't RSVP, Teresa will jack you up. Nah, she, will, she won't do that. She's nice most of the time. Unless you're a certain person. Then she's not so nice. And you guys don't know that person, but I do. <laughs> but, <laughs> but she can't jack you up, though, that's for sure. Um, no, but... Uh, seriously, guys, uh, look into it. If you got questions, if you want to know what they're about, she got videos and pictures, and she'll share with you. We talk to some of the ladies that have been to them that, that have that come here, and they'll tell you they're worth coming to. Invest in yourselves, ladies. Again, us dudes. Now that guys are starting to show up more, we want to get something going really soon like this for the dudes. Um, so that's the plan. I, we have something possibly scheduled until it's all. Until it's prepared, I'm not giving a date. But there's something possibly that we're doing for the dudes. We'll see. If the guys get together and do it, it's Emmanuel and Pastor Anthony. We'll see. If they get it together, we'll do it in October. If they don't, well, then we'll go out and eat bobs. You know? And we'll fellowship around patty melts and chili fries. You know? But <laughs> you guys want to open up your Bibles to Numbers chapter 3. We're going to cover chapters 3 and chapter 4. Numbers chapter 3 and chapter 4. Father, we thank you for being our God. We thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. We ask that as we get into your word, Lord, that you would open up our hearts to hear your voice. And what am I thinking? We bless you first, Lord. We lift your name high. We glorify you because you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and we just want to praise you, Lord. And then as we get into your word, would you open our hearts and open our ears to hear your word and to receive what it is you have for us this evening. I pray, Father, that you would get me out of your way, get me out of my own way and have your way in and through me. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would be glorified this morning, in your, this morning, this evening in your word. Be glorified in the worship that we give to you as we go through your word. We pray that your word would challenge us, Lord, that your word would shape us and change us and transform us. Help us to be like you in our words, in our thoughts, in our attitudes, in our deeds. We love you, Lord, and we want you more than anything. You are the blessing that we so eagerly seek after, Father. And we just bless your holy name, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Sorry, my notes are loading. I don't know why they've been doing this lately. They've, like, it's talking to the cloud, so I'll just pick up with what I remember. Um, when I was young, I used to work at Gabaldon Mortuary. That was my family's business. Um, yes, that's pretty annoying, huh? 
That's the devil. Between my notes and this, I'm just going to sum it up to spiritual warfare. So God has something for you to prepare. Um, who is it? I don't know. That's rude, but I'm sure they don't know we're in here. But anyways, if you need me to turn it louder, I have a volume knob here. Just let me know. Um, but I, I worked for Gabaldon Mortuary. My family started the business like in the 50s, and it ran all the way up until several years ago. And it's still called Gabaldon Mortuary. It's just not run by any Gabaldons. And when I was young, I would work there because it was the family business. You know, you'd go, and when I was young, I didn't, like, deal with the dead bodies so much. I pulled weeds, I washed hearses, cleaned the garages, cleaned the offices. You know, they had these blowers, and gas-propelled blowers, kind of like that annoying drill, but blew air. We'd, those were fun. You know, you go to the street and just blow air at the cars, blow the dirt at the cars. Kind of jacked up, too, but, you know, I did it. The thing that was really difficult about working there was there were like seven different owners. And one by one, kids would sell off their shares. And by the time I was working there, there were four primary owners. It was my Nina Dorothy, my Nino Liz. I know it sounds odd. I was baptized by two women. So one was Nina, one was Nino. That's why I call Liz Nino. My Uncle Greg and my Uncle Rick, they were the four owners when I was working there as a kid. And what made it difficult was they were all equal owners. So my Nina would tell me to go wash the hearses. So I'd be out there washing the hearses, drying them, and my uncle would come, what are you doing? Washing the hearses. No, no, I need you to go pull the weeds. Huh? Stop what I'm doing. I go out there, I'm pulling weeds. My uncle Greg would show up. What are you doing? Uncle, uncle Rick told me to pull the weeds. No, 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 I need you to go vacuum the, 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 the chapel. We have a family coming. My mom vacuuming the chapel. My Nina would show up. What are you doing? <laughs> vacuuming. I'm serious. This was... Every single time I went to work, there, it was, this was the issue. And it got to a point where, you know, they would end up in a fight and they'd be like, look, we need one person to tell us what's going on. Like, there's got to be somebody who's in charge here. And it's hard because they're all in charge. And that's when you're working with family, there is that real headbutting that takes place. And the problem was, like, well, who do we listen to? Uncle Rick's the boss. So is Uncle Greg. So is Nina. So is Nino. Who's telling us what? To, who's paying me? At the end of the day, who's going to hand me the money? That's who I want to listen to. You know? And, you know, and it got to a point where we all had to agree whenever we came in, who's the boss for that day? Because there was no structure. There was no order. And all it did was cause turmoil in me and cause arguing amongst the owners. The reason I say that is because today God is going to show some of the structure of the Levitical layout for those who accompany the tabernacle. It wasn't like people just all like huddled together and they all just kind of took part and took position and went off and ran and did their own thing. God gave specific orders to, to specific tribes and lineages. I shouldn't say tribes because it's the tribe of Levi we're going to see today primarily. But the tribe of Levi contains several different tribes within the tribe is what I'm going to call them. We're going to see the Kohathites, the Merarites, and I can't remember that, it's the middle one. It's the one, ah, stupid notes. I'll just read it, it's right here. Who is it? No, it starts with a G. It's like Gergeshites. But it's not, I don't think it's the Gergeshites. No, Gershon, the Gershonites. There you go. It's the Kohathites, the Gershonites, and the Merarites. And these are the three primary tribes that are spoken of from the tribe of Levi. These are the, gu the guys that get to work the tabernacle. Now, they don't all have equal shares. We're going to find that from the Kohathites comes a person named Amram. Amram has these kids named Aaron and Moses. These are going to be the primary guys who work the inner workings of the temple. The rest of the Kohathites and the rest of the Gershonites and the Merarites, they're going to do things like carry the, the blankets, carry the, the, the tarps that cover the tabernacle, carry the poles and the, 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 the pillars. They're the ones that are going to do all the work as they travel. And that's going to be their primary job. And we're going to see that although those jobs look menial, they look like they're nothing much, that the temple could not function without them. They're primary. And I say that because that's a, an issue in the church today. We all feel like we got to be seen. We feel like we have to do this, what I do. And if you don't do this, well, then you're not doing much. And if I'm not going to do this, then i got to do what Kurt does. i gotta, I got to sing so the world can see me. But the truth is, it's the unseen parts of the body that are often the most vital. You can live without a tongue. 
You can't live without a heart. Can't live without lungs. When was the last time you saw your lungs? Well, if you saw them, if you, then you're dead. You know, because that's how that, unless you got a lung transplant and they slapped your lung on the table and said, your lungs. But then those aren't your lungs anymore. So the point is that the body works in unity, not in discord. That God is a God of order, not of disorder. And we're going to see God's unified order today. And I'm sorry, these stupid notes, I wish they would work. I don't know. I guess I'm going to teach you that my own today. Chapter 3 of verse 1, it says, Now these are the records of the generations of Aaron and Moses at the time when Yahweh spoke with Moses on Mount Sinai. And so this is while they're still at Mount Sinai. They're camped at the base. God has given to Moses many of the things already spoken of. We've seen them through Exodus. We've seen them through the Levitical, you know, the book of Le- uh, the Levites, as he gave the little Levitical outline of what he expects of the Levites and much of the congregation of Israel. And here it tells us that they're still at that base, and Moses is now going to census the Levites. And he starts with Aaron. He says, these are the generations of Aaron and Moses, even though Moses isn't really, geneal- his genealogy is not here, it's Aaron's. It says, at the time when Yahweh spoke with Moses on Mount Sinai, these are the numbers of the names, or these are the names of the sons of Aaron, Nadab, firstborn, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. These are the names of the sons of Aaron, the anointed priest whom he ordained to serve as priests. I'm going to stop there real quick. And so there are four names that are mentioned. Nadab, Abihu, Ithamar, and... Who is that third one? Fourth one? Eleazar. Eleazar, thank you. At this point, not a whole lot of time has passed, except about a year. And so there hasn't been much time for the children of Israel to procreate. And, you know, for those of us that have kids, it's, it's, it's a lengthy process. You know, some people kick them out quicker than others, but... You're still at a nine-month gestation period. It still takes time. It's The baby's got to cook. We call it bun in the oven. You're baking the baby. So it's been only a year, so there hasn't been much time for procreating here. And so only four of Aaron's sons are mentioned. So with Aaron, Moses included, and these four sons, this is the whole entirety of the priesthood. Moses is special. His kids don't get to operate as priests. Only he does. Aaron's sons, however, will go forward in the manner of the priesthood. In verse 4, we get a little bit of information here that if you were with us several months back, you remember. It says, But Nadab and Abihu died before Yahweh when they offered strange fire before Yahweh in the wilderness of Sinai. And they had no children. So Eleazar and Ithamar served as priests in the lifetime of their father, Aaron. Now, that strange fire, I want to talk a little bit about it from what I remember in my notes at least. I'll try to pull from what I remember studying. When we back up to Leviticus chapter 10, there's this break that takes place. God's already given many of the commands on how he's to be approached. And does anybody remember the key theme of the book of Leviticus? Holiness. That's the key word, part of the key theme. The key theme is God is holy. But holiness is the perfect word to summarize the entire book. Holiness, holiness. That word is repeated, I I should have counted them, over and over and over. We saw that God is holy. And that command often comes with, treat God as holy or die. We're going to see that again today several times. It's going to be reiterated. And we remember in chapter 10 that we get this little narrative break where Nadab and Abihu, they go before God And they offer strange fire. And for this, the Bible says, fire comes out from the throne and consumes them and they die. And when we go back, we look at the strange fire and we're not told exactly what it was. But it appears that they they prepared some type of incense offering to God that wasn't of the holy command that God said that should be prepared when he is worshipped. And then as we continue forward in chapter 10 of Leviticus, we saw that God made it a point to say, do not approach him while drunk. Not in those exact words, but with the essence of don't drink and worship God. And from that, we concluded that whatever Nadab and Abihu, Abihu, whatever they worshiped God with, one, it was strange. It wasn't what the holy command was from the Lord. And it appears that they were intoxicated when they made this offering. 
For this, God says, don't worship me in this manner. And then he sets Nadab and Abihu as an example before the entire congregation, and he kills them. They die. They die for their irreverence to God. Now, I can't look at my notes, but from what I remember, this is how the church treats God today. And it is an extraordinarily sad thing to watch is we don't worship God the way he prescribes us to worship him. You see people worshiping God how they feel. As a matter of fact, that's the word that people use, I feel. Typically when I hear words like I feel, the first thing I say is I don't care. I don't care what you feel. You'll feel my boot in your butt if you don't shut up. You know, I won't kick you in the butt. More than likely, it depends on what you do, you know, but, but more than likely, you ain't going to get kicked in the butt. I love you guys. But your feelings, as much as I love them, as much as I want to be careful with them, I also don't care. And I'm in this weird spot where I want to protect your feelings, but I also want to take your feelings and smash them up and throw them out the door because we live in a society where feelings are the ultimate authority and your feelings have to be set aside. And I'm going to tell you why, because your feelings lie to you. That is one of the most dangerous things that, 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 that exists within you is how you feel. And then we use things like the heart, right? We say, oh, just follow your heart. And we associate the heart with the feelings and the feelings with the heart. And then we read the Bible and it says the heart is deceitfully wicked above all else. Who can know it? God can know it. The Bible says your heart is evil. My heart is evil. Our feelings are evil. If I operated off every instinctive feeling that came within me, oh my word. I, I don't even want to share with you guys where I would be because even to this day, to today, if I operated on my feelings alone, if I just disregarded the command of God and His holiness, if I disregarded the Spirit of God and His leading and direction, and I just followed my feelings... I wish I could tell you I've mastered them and, oh, I'm, I'm the perfect Christian. I'm not even close. Oh, you know, my auntie was saying earlier that, uh, she's like, I hope I'm never road raging on one of you guys on the street. <laughs> I feel like that when I drive all the time. I'm like, I hope that while I'm over here acting all stupid, it's not like somebody like is, Emmanuel says, hey, brother. I'm like, oh, crap, it's you. <laughs> I did that. I was just checking to see how Christian you are, brother. You know? No, like, I get in my modes where it's like, you know, Albuquerque drivers are stupid. I, I love my people, but, like, I watch them drive, and I'm like, what is wrong with you? Like, I love you, but get off the road, please. Or learn how to drive. You got two types of drivers. The ones that don't know how to drive because they're too slow, or the guys that think this is the Indy 500. There's, like, nobody that just is that good middle and I'll be honest, I'm sometimes on both ends of that, you know, and, you know, I think about it too. Her, oh, you got snitched, you know, it's because she's got, <laughs> it's because she's got the challenge. Oh, you got a car like that, I mean, you know, but, but, but you know, if we base life off of how we feel, you would find that you'd be living in sin the majority of the time. You wouldn't come to church the majority of the time. You want to know how often I feel like coming? Seriously. Yeah, whoever said, did Kurt say that? Dave said that. Thanks, Dave. No confidence. You know, it's true, though. I'm tired. I'm so tired. Like, I am. I wish I wasn't. I wish, like, I had, like, I wish I was that bunny on the old school commercials that just never went, that never, what is it called? The, the Energizer Bunny? That thing just goes, I'm not like that. Like, I get tired, man. And I'm like, pfft. And it's before church is when I'm the most tired. Come like 5 o'clock on Wednesday, I'm like, I'm going to call in. <laughs> you know, you know, I tell my wife all the time, I always make the joke, and she says, let's do it. You know, and you know, we, well, we love coming. Please don't take it wrong. But it doesn't change the fact that I'm tired. Sunday mornings, you know, I love you guys, but I want to sleep in. I'll tell you honest with you. I would love to sleep to like 10. But I don't because I love you guys, because I love the Lord and the calling that he set before me. Doesn't mean that I don't feel these things. You might think like, well, I'm a terrible person. Oh, yeah. That's why you don't follow me. And if you've been following me, stop. Following me is by far one of the stupidest things you will ever do. You don't follow men. You follow the living God. Now, God has placed me here as a directional post. And he's given me a voice and he speaks through me. 
but you don't follow the message. You follow the one whom the message is about. You follow God. Nadab and Abihu, they worshiped God how they felt. And for it, they died. We see this play out again in the New Testament church with Ananias and Sapphira. They, um, they essentially do something similar. Not in those exact, you know, I'm not going to break down what they did, but essentially they came, they lied to God, they worshiped God with how they felt rather than what the command from God was. And the crazy thing about the command from God is they weren't bound by anything. They just, what they did is they decided to lie to God. And by doing so, they dishonored His holiness. I'll tell you what they did. So in the early church, what they would do is people would sell their stuff and they'd bring it to the apostles, they'd give it to the apostles, and they'd live like in a commune. And everybody would just take care of each other. And so Ananias and Sapphira, we don't know much about them, but they had money of, to some degree, and they sold their stuff. And they came in, they laid the, 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 the proceeds at the feet of Peter. And they say, here's everything that we've had and sold, and we give it to God. And Peter's probably like, dope. And then he looks at them and says, Ananias and Sapphira had got off, gone off into the market. He tells Ananias, why have you conspired to lie against the Spirit of God? He goes, huh? He says, you're lying to God. He says, when you sold the property, it was yours. The property was yours. It was always yours. And then you sold it. The proceeds were yours, Ananias. They, they were yours. You didn't have to give anything if you didn't want to. He says, so why have you lied to God? He says, have you kept this and this much amount aside? Ananias says, yeah. He says, because you've lied to God, today these men will bury you outside this door. And he drops dead. A couple hours later, Sapphira comes in and he tells Sapphira, hey, did you sell the lamb for such and such a price? She goes, yeah. He says, why have you conspired together with your husband to lie to the Spirit of God? She goes, huh? He says, yeah. The land, it was yours. The money, it was yours. See, the issue was they sold their stuff. They held back price and then they came to Peter and said, we give everything to God. This is, we sold it and we give everything, all the proceeds to God. It, he tells them, it was yours. You could have done anything you wanted with it. You could have kept it. But you lied to God. You have treated God with irreverence. And he tells her, for this, you'll be buried next to your husband. She's probably like, wait, what? And then died. And they dragged her out and they buried her out next to her husband. And it says, fear gripped the church. Can you imagine if God did that to the church today for our irreverence? There would be no Christians left. At least in America. Because we are in such a way that we just worship God in such an irreverential way by and far. And that's not meant to be a slap at you guys. It's meant to be a wake-up call and a check. God is holy and He's meant to be treated as such. And if we were to treat God the way it's designed for us to treat them, Christianity in this country would bloom. And it would be a powerhouse to be reckoned with instead of, or like a crippled, dying, diseased old man in America. The church has such little power. And I believe the greatest reason why is because the irreverence towards the living God. In verse 5 it says, Then Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Bring the tribe of Levi near and set them before Aaron the priest, that they may serve him. So God separates the tribe of Levi for Aaron and his sons. Now again, remember this is going to include the Kohathites, the Gershonites, and the Merarites. These are the three main groups that come from Levi. And Aaron is a part of this grouping. Aaron is from the Kohathites. It's, have you ever heard the word Kohen? It comes from that word, and that actually means the priesthood, the priests. That's what priest is, Kohen. If you've ever met somebody with the last name Kohen, there's a good chance that they have a direct link to the Kohenites of modern Israel today. That, that name has been kept alive throughout the years. Doesn't mean it is, but it's very possible. But anyways, the priests get the Levites for the service of the tabernacle because the priests can't do everything themselves. They're going to be burdened with their own services, with their own works. Verse 7, They shall perform the duties for him and for the whole congregation before the tent of meeting 
to do the service of the tabernacle. They shall also keep the furnishings of the tent of meeting, along with the duties of the sons of Israel, to do the service of the tabernacle. You shall thus give the Levites to Aaron and to his sons. They are wholly given to him from among the sons of Israel. And so it's, it's, it's pretty simple and straightforward. God is preparing to set the tribe, these are these three groups of this tribe apart for Aaron and for the helping of the tabernacle. And we're going to see how this kind of uh, wraps together as we go forward and how they all come together as one body for the service of the living God. And this is going to apply to a lot of you guys because just like we're going to see the service of the tabernacle, this is how the service of the church works today. It's not meant to fall on the head of one person. The church is meant to come together as a body and we're meant to move in unity you know, when you go to church and it's just a show and you guys come and you sit and it's a show when, you know, there's no participation, that's typically a bad sign. And I know it's tough, especially in a smaller church like this where, you know, there's not a whole lot where you can do. People always come, what can I do? Well, the greatest thing you have to offer this body at this particular moment is your fellowship. Yeah, congregate. After service, don't just shoot out the doors. But I got a life. Yeah, but you have a spirit. And that spirit needs to be fed. The greatest way that spirit can get fed is not so much this, which this is good, the hearing of the word of God being taught and spoken. But when we come together and we fellowship with each other, we build each other up in the faith. The Proverbs, uh, the, it's written, it's like Proverbs 17, that iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another, as iron sharpens iron. This is iron, this is iron, one's used, the other somebody else. You come together and you sharpen each other up. That is one of the greatest gifts God has given us is fellowship. And I watch the body, we just disregard fellowship. We just jump out the door and we just want to get home. I did my church. Fellowship. That's the best thing you can offer this little body at this particular moment. In time, more things will open up. Till then, this is what you got. Verse 10, So you shall appoint Aaron and his sons that they may keep their priesthood. But the layman who comes near shall be put to death. So as God prepares to bring the Kohathites, the Gershonites, the Merarites near, these are all part of Levi, right? But Aaron is set apart from the Kohathites, him and his children only, to serve in the tabernacle. God puts the warning at the forefront, says if the layman, the layman are the Kohathites, everyone that's not Aaron and his sons, the Gershonites, the Merarites, anybody or from any of the other tribes, if they come near, what will happen to them? They will die. It's at the forefront. It's a warning. The essence of what God is saying is, I am holy and I shall be treated as such. And if you don't, I will kill you. Now, I know that sounds harsh, right? Because what's one of God's commands? What is it? Thou shalt not murder is what it is. It's not kill. Did you know the Bible has no prohibition on killing at all? There isn't. Killing is actually a necessary thing. Unfortunately, it is. Killing is something that should be done. I think people should die. I think there's a lot of people that need to die. You think I'm kidding? I'm not kidding. I could think of a couple groups, we'll call them branches, that should be strung up and hung for treason. I'm being very generic. We have a constitution that has been violated on so many fronts, and in that constitution it says the penalty for treason is death. Mm -hmm. That hasn't changed. That's still there. Why are they alive? Did you know if, people, if we were to take that seriously, people would stop violating the oath of office? But we don't because we're nice. And we care about your feelings. We actually, your feelings mean more to us than our freedoms. Violate the oath. Go ahead. Violate our freedom. No, I think they should die. I think pedophiles should die. If you are charged with murder, and it is with absolute certainty, it is without a reasonable doubt, it's, it's more than just hearsay, there is 100% undeniable proof, video evidence that you murdered somebody, you should be murdered, you should be killed. If we did these things and implemented these things, I'm going to say 50% of America's crime would stop. The corruption in government would stop. 
Did you know that everything that I just mentioned by and far was implemented by God? Most of you were with me as we went over these through Exodus and in Leviticus, right? The death penalty, lex talionis, the, the, the law of exact retribution, that was given by God. In this day, the law that was violated was God's law. And he gave the parameters for the violating of that law was death. And he mentions why they die. So that the children of Israel would fear the Lord and not sin against him anymore. But when you give no penalty for error, then nobody cares. That's why all these people that are on drugs on the streets, they just keep doing them because they get locked up and they let them out two days later. That's why pedophiles keep... I mean, now we're in a movement where they're trying to make it normal. That's, I, I can't even wrap my head around that, that they're trying to make pedophilia normal. Dude, if you're a pedophile, don't even come near me. I don't care if I'm a pastor. I'll, I'll turn thug on you. <laughs> like, you know, the pastor's going out the window, bro. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start talking hood. I'll jack you up unless you're coming to repent. But, like, if somebody's, like, trying to talk to me about, like, I want to have sex with the little boy, you're not meeting Pastor Walter. I'm just going to let you know straightforward. Like, you're going to meet somebody else. And I don't care. You guys can leave the church back. I can't believe he did that. I'll do it. I don't even care. And if you can't get behind me on that, I'm okay with that. And I will answer to God for that. And I will answer with a whole heart. I'm not okay with that. Raping little kids. Do you know what that's going to do to this next generation? It's going to destroy them. Rape destroys people. Why do you think so many of these people that are molested end up the way they are? You know this whole transgender movement? If you were to sit down, if we were to do an actual study, I'm going to say probably 80 to 90% of them were molested as children. I'm not, you can, there, there actually is some research. You'll find most of them come from childhood trauma, most of which deal with sexual assault. It disorients, disorients, disfigures the perception of their reality and it absolutely jacks them up. You ruin that child's life. They should die. God warns them. Say it again. Burn them at the stake. Burn them at the stake. Yep. People wouldn't do it anymore. If you knew you're going to get lit on fire, people would stop doing it. Again, does that hurt my heart to know that people have to die over this? Yes. But the Bible never commands that you should not kill. It commands that you should not murder. That is killing with malicious intent. That's pre-planned killing. It's the idea of... You've done nothing deserving of death and I'm going to kill you out of hate because I don't like you for whatever my reasons might be. Josh's beard just looks a little bit cooler than mine. He's got to go. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that, that's murder. The Bible says you can't do that. If you do that, then you die also. Then you're to be put to death with them. But the Bible never says you shall not kill. It just says you shall not murder. Verse 11, again, Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, Now behold, I have taken the Levites from among the sons of Israel instead of every firstborn, the first issue of the womb among the sons of Israel, so the Levites shall be mine. For all the firstborn are mine. On the day that I struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I sanctified to myself all the firstborn in Israel from man to beast. They shall be mine. I am Yahweh. Then Yahweh spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, saying, Number the sons of Levi by their fathers' households, by their families, every male, from a month old upward, you shall number. And I'm going to just stop there real quick. So he mentions the firstborn. We saw that in Exodus chapter 12 when God institutes the Passover. And he's talking about the firstborn of every son of the Egyptians or not even the Egyptians, the firstborn of everyone who doesn't place the blood on the lintels and on the doorpost. The firstborn of that household shall die. That included the Israelites. That was everybody. But the Israelites got the blood, and they're like, we better listen to this God because he keeps doing all this crazy stuff. This is the living God. And so, by and far, their children don't die. The Egyptians, however, are awoken to a massacre. The firstborn in every Egyptian household is dead. And when God says this, he says, I sanctify to me the first issue of every womb. The firstborn of every womb is mine. And so God just reiterates that. The firstborn of every woman is mine. And now he's going to have them number the sons of Israel to correspond. Or he's going to number the, the Levites. And then he's going to number Israel to correspond the firstborn with the amount of Levites there are. Because God is going to make the allowance rather than taking the firstborn of every 
male of Israel, he's going to allow a Levite to take that place and so to speak, redeem that person. It's a beautiful thing. We kind of saw that in the book of Leviticus. Remember how people weren't allowed to work the temple? And the idea of the firstborn being gods is they would come to work the temple. They would now belong to God. Well, who could approach the temple? Just the Levites. Nobody else. The Levites could work the construction. They could build. They could tear it down. They could carry the poles, the tarps, the pieces. The, 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 the priests, they could actually enter into the inner workings and handle the stuff. But the regular layman of Israel could not. So God's going to make the allowance for the children of Levi to cover the firstborn of every of the firstborn in the entire nation of Israel. So then in verse 14 he says, Yahweh spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai saying, Number the sons of Levi by their father's households, by their families, every male from a month old and upward you shall number. So Moses numbered them according to the word of Yahweh just as he had been commanded. These then are the sons of Levi by their names, Gershon and Kohat. And I said Kohat. So quickly, in Hebrew, there's no th. It's just t. t so sometimes I'll use the th, but usually I'll say t. Because I like it better. It just sounds more proper. It's Gershon, uh, Kohat. Where am I here? And Merari. These are the names of the sons of Gershon by their families, Libni and Shemai. These are the sons of Kohat by their families, Amram and Ishar, Hebron and Uziel, and the sons of Merari by their families, Mahli, Mushi. These are the families of the Levites according to their father's households. Of Gershon was the family of the Libnites and the family of the Shemites. These were the families of the Gershonites. Their numbered men in the numbering of every male from a month old and upward, even their numbered men were 7,500. The families of the Gershonites were to camp behind the tabernacle westward. And the leaders of the father's households of the Gershonites was Eliasaph, the son of Lael. And so we see of the Gershonites, 7,500 are numbered. And where do they camp? They camp, was it eastward or westward? Westward, in my notes, I have it all documented. Man, I'm so bummed out by this stupid thing. I'm going to try something right away. You know, I did that the other day where I, uh, I don't know what I did. Um, I did something stupid and all my notes disappeared and I had a panic attack. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I flipped my wig. I got six years worth of notes and my goal is at some point to translate all these into commentaries and I freaked out and then I was going through all the settings and it turns out that uh. They were still there, just on the cloud. But I don't know why it's having trouble reading the cloud. I don't know what the issue is. Fire. But, huh? It's fire? Bro. It's fire? It's that good stuff, bro. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm lost. I don't know what he means. But anyways, so the Gershonites, they camp on the west side of the tabernacle. And in verse 25, it says, Now the duties of the sons of Gershon at the tent of meeting involved the tabernacle and the tent, its covering and the screen for the doorway of the tent of meeting, and the hangings of the court and the screen for the doorway of the court, which is around the tabernacle and the altar and its cords, according to all the service concerning them. And so of Kohat, I'm sorry, of, of Gershon, there's 7,500 of them, and their job is to carry the tents. So if we remember back in Exodus, we saw the construction of the tabernacle. And there is a ton of tarp-like things, animal skins. If you remember, the tabernacle itself is covered with like four or five layers of skins, of purpoi skins and ram skins and, and like silks. And maybe not silks, but if, if you remember, there's all these different types of fabrics that go into covering the tabernacle. And then even the covering of the gates all around and the screen as you go in and even the veil. And so there's all of this fabric that's there. And this is a lot of stuff. God says the Gershonites get the honor of being able to move those. Now, if you're a Gershonite, you might think, well, that's whack. That's like when Walter, when you ask Pastor Walter, hey, Pastor Walter, how can I serve? And I say, fellowship. Oh, that's whack. I thought you were going to say, like, I could teach Sunday mornings. You know, I don't know what you guys expect right now. <laughs> I don't know. But I'm like, you know, fellowship. And then there's, there's like this, oh, that's messed up. I, I could do that without, well, then do it. You know, the funny thing is, 
as we go forward, as we grow, because we have grown, we're gonna, we are gonna grow. I'm just letting you guys know. This place is gonna grow. If you're one of those people that's like, I hate big churches, this might not be the place for you because it's going to grow. To what size, I don't know. For those of you that have been here from the beginning, we've seen this place go to where there's nowhere to move and then it shrinks and then it grows and then it shrinks and then we're growing again. And now there's a lot of young men showing up and that's the exciting, most exciting part because the men are where it's at. I love you ladies, but the men are where it's at. Women are the life of the church. Men are the health of the church. Where there is a church, women will be present. From the book of Acts to today, women are the life of the church, but men are the health of the church. If there aren't men uniting in the church, then you have a dying church. And so as I see men gathering together, it's exciting because I'm like, yeah. And now God just needs to open up the door for us to get the right spot so that we can really expand. And in his time, he will. I don't want to rush it. When he opens those doors, it's going to be so sweet. But... Until then, people will say, what can I do? And I say, fellowship. Oh, man, I don't want to do that. Then you're not fit for anything else in this church. If you can't do the lowest level of service, which is to serve each other, serve each, I mean, and it's fun. That's like the craziest part. Like, it's like it's a joy to fellowship. You get built up. They get built up. It's a beautiful thing on both ends. But if you can't do the lowest end of service, then you are not fit to do anything else. I don't even want you cleaning the bathrooms. If you can't fellowship with the body of Christ, then, then there's nowhere for you to go forward. Come to church. Come learn, please. But as far as service goes, I got no use for you. I know that sounds mean. <laughs> I feel like saying it is mean, but it's the truth. It's what? The least of the, you know, Jesus said that the least will be the greatest, that the last will be first and the first will be last. Man, we all think it's about getting here, and it's not. I'm convinced when we go to heaven, we're not going to see preachers as the most honored in the in the heaven before God. I, I believe it with my whole heart. I mean, we all probably think Billy Graham's up there in some massive mansion. I'm willing to bet that there we're going to see janitors that are more honored than Billy Graham. And I know that's hard for us to take in because we use different scales than God. We weigh works differently than God. I believe God weighs faithfulness more than he does the work. So yeah, I show up three times a week and teach you guys, but some of you are way more faithful in your daily walks with the Lord than I am. You will be honored more than I will be honored before God because it's not about what you did, it's about the faithfulness of what you did. And if you clean toilets the way God said to him, when he said to him, and you never questioned, you just did what he asked without question, you're going to be honored more than Because I question God all the time. Yeah. I'm a pain in God's butt, I bet. <laughs> yeah, I know it sounds funny. I believe it. I'm like, I tell you guys all the time, I didn't make God's team better. I put his team backwards. Like, God would be better off without me. He says they and, well, you know, He does. God would truly be better off without me. So why does he use me? For the glory of his name, for that reason there alone. For that, what I just said, that glorifies God all the more so that when he uses me, you know it's him. You know it's him. And I don't say that to be humble. I, you guys, for those of you that know me, you know. The rest of you, you'll learn. <laughs> but here... They get the honor of carrying the tarps. Yay! What a blessing. So, what a blessing, though. They get to handle the holy objects of God. Many of them are going to look at this with disdain. We're going to actually see later on in Numbers, there's going to be a rebellion against Aaron and Moses from some of these guys. Verse 27 of Kohat was the family of the Amramites and the family of the Isharites, and the family of the Hebronites, and the family of the Uzielites. These were the families of the Kohathites. In the numbering of every male from a month upward, these were 8,600 performing the duties of the sanctuary. The families of the sons of Kohat were to camp on the southward side of the tabernacle. And the leader of the father's households of the Kohathites' families were Elizaphan and Uziel. Now their duties involved the ark, the table, the lampstand, the altars, and the utensils of the sanctuary with which they minister, and the screen and all the service concerning them. And Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, 
was the chief of the leaders of Levi and had oversight over those who performed the duties of the sanctuary. So now the Kohathites, they get to get a little bit closer than the Gershonites. They get to carry the holy objects, the Ark of the Covenant. They get to carry the, the, the lampstand, the, the, the table of showbread, the altar of incense. These are some pretty heavy deals. This is like, if we were in this day, this is, without being a priest, this is as close as you're going to get to the objects of God. Now, they don't get to handle them outright. We're going to see that the priests were in charge of covering them all up before they even came to touch them. And we'll see that that plays a really big role. But they got to get a little bit closer, so there might feel like a little bit of a, what's the word I'm looking for here? Arrogance that accompanies that, right? Because you know how it is, right? Well, God uses me. Rather than, <laughs> God uses me, holy smokes. Both say the same thing. There's two different attitudes that accompany them. And if I, if I remember right, if memory serves me right, the Kohathites are going to bring some serious charges against Aaron and against Moses. And remember, the Kohathites are the group in which they come from. It says that Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, he was the chief of them and of the Levites. Now, Eleazar was now Aaron's oldest son because his oldest son is now dead. Remember, um, Nadab, that was his oldest. He died. Uh, Abihu, who was the second oldest, he died. So now Eleazar is the next in line. So when Aaron does kick the bucket, Eleazar is going to be the one that takes the torch and he's going to go on as the high priest. And he will be like the big dog. But till then, he serves in a position where he's over the tribe of Levi. He's the head of Levi and he's the head of these groups and he's basically kind of like their boss. And to that note, I say God puts order in his body. It's not a popular thing for the pastor to be in charge. Unfortunately, the pastor is in charge. Like this particular body, we structured it, I structured it in such a way that my board can't ever take control. I love my board. Kurt's on my board. I take their advice. I think that the board is absolutely necessary. And the board should never serve as, how do I say this, as an authority to move, but they should serve as a board of wisdom. And it's on the people to be praying for the pastor and for the pastor to be, you know, in his own walk so that when he goes to his board and receives wisdom from his board, that he takes that wisdom in and uses it and doesn't just... So that there's a danger in it also. By all means, like the danger is if I decided to go whack job, I can just be a whack job. and pfft. That's why the prayers of the people are necessary. The reason I structured our fellowship this way is because I need to know that I'm going to accomplish what God has said in my heart without being strong-armed in any direction. So I've shared with you guys like some of my desires, like my desire at some point. And I stand on this. And if God lets me, I'm going to do it. And for those of you that don't know me, talk to my sister because she'll tell you how hard-headed I really am. You have no clue, I promise you guys. You, have, you, just, you guys don't know me that well. None of you do because I don't let anybody in that much. My wife knows. You can ask her too. She'll tell you. My goal is to open up a school at some point. That is my goal. And my goal isn't just to open up a school. It's to open up a school so that we can bring the kids in for free. Because I don't see the school as an opportunity to make a dime. I see it as an investment into the souls of the next generation. And that's what I wish that these big churches would see when they open their schools. Rather than looking to the parents and saying, if you loved your kids, you'd bring them to our Christian schools where we're going to tax you an arm and a leg in this already you know, arm and leg taxing society. And if you loved your kids, you would. And then you make the parents feel this big. So... And what's crazy is these same churches talk about we don't believe in debt. However, they'll encourage us to go into debt to send our kids to school. Isn't that a little contradictory there? Just, just a little bit. And the crazy thing is they have the funds to send their kids to school for free. They have the funds to send every kid in their school system, the, these private Christian school systems, for free. So why wouldn't they do that? What do you think the reason is they don't do that? Because there's no profit in it. And to that, that, that pisses me off. Because the prophet is the souls of these kids. What, what do you mean there's no prophet? The prophet is you're reaching the entire next generation, yet you're not making a buck on it. But that's what the tithe is for. What do you think? The, that's not just money that just comes in to sit there. That's money that God brings in for the building up of his body. But the churches take the tithe in, we sit on it, 
We stack, stack, store, store, stack, stack, store, which I'm learning. I was talking to somebody. We have to learn how to be, what's the word we used earlier? We have to learn to be good stewards with what comes in. You can't be just stupid with it. But we stack and stack and stack so much that we can spend $50 million on a building. And then another 30 or $40 million on another building. Which, cool. But then we're going to turn around and tell you ten grand tuition. Why not, why not just ditch the buildings, use the massive campuses you already have, and invest in these children? And stop weighing the necks of these people that are giving that's my goal. And I've told you guys, if God ever brings us to that point, and if my board ever looks at me and says, I think it's a bad idea, we need to make money, I'm going to fire them on spot. Because in my bylaws, I reserve that right. And if they don't got that vision, then you have no place on my board. And that's harsh. I know that's, that's mean. I don't care. I'm serious about that. Now, they're welcome to give me some insight. And I'll listen to certain things. When it comes to that, I'm not listening. That is something that God has put in my heart, and I'm going to do it so long as he opens that door. And that is not a joke. Kurt, I don't want to fire you. <laughs> you. You know, man. You know. He's like, I don't care. You don't pay me anyway. I'll stop making you coffees. You have to make, you know. You know but in all seriousness, it's, it really is a big deal. And, that, and, and God has risen up certain people to certain positions. And it's not always an easy thing to submit to the vision that God has given to the leader. But trust that God is working through that leader and God is using that leader. You know, again, my, my perception isn't perfect. So when people have ideas, I'll listen. And I want you guys to know whenever you present me ideas, it's likely that I've already entertained the idea you're going to present. Present it anyway. I never just make decisions spur of the moment. It's not what I do. I'll sit there and I'll weigh out 52 other different ideas. In my own mind, I'll play it out in every way I can think possible. And so typically when people bring me an idea, I'm like, that's a good idea. But we're not in a place. Like, Teresa will often give me ideas with the church. And I'm like, it's a great idea. I've already thought of that. But we're just too small to do that right now. Because she's a designer, so she wants to design and do it. And I love her ideas. But I'm like, you know, we can only stick so much stuff up on the walls before it's... <laughs> you know, like, so, but as it grows, I, I'm excited to bring her and be like, what you, what's, your, what's your vision? Let's, let's do this. Because she's got great vision, but here we're kind of maxed out. Anyways, I got to go forward. What verse was I on? Um, 30? 33? Yep, yep, all right. Of Merari was the family of the Mahlites and the family of the Mushites. These were the families of Merari. Their numbered men and the numbering of every male from a month old and upward were 6,200. The leader of the father's households of the families of Merari were Zuriel, the son of Abihel. They were to camp on the northward side of the tabernacle. Now the appointed duties of the sons of Merari involved the frames, the tabernacle, its bars, its pillars, its sockets, and its equipment, and the service concerning them. And the pillars around the court with their sockets and their pegs and their cords. And so Marahri, they took the more fine-tuned things of the ta tabernacle. If we remember, there's all those little sockets, the ringlets that hold the curtains together, the straps, the things of that nature. That's what they're carrying. Again, it seems like a little less weighty, like a, a little less honorable, but it's an attitude thing. You know, the thing that we deem as honorable is often not as honorable as you think it is. Again, I look back to the pastoral position. Every, I've known people that want this. And to my question, it's always, why? This is hard, man. Like, this is really, this is like not for the weak-hearted. That's fair, right? This is not for the weak-hearted. Like, it is a calling, and if God didn't call you, you're better off not. I'll actually try to talk people out of it when they're talking about, like, this is what I want. It has to be a burning in your bones. It has to be a call from God. It has to be something that you can't shake. I was once asked, if you could do anything other than be a pastor, what would you be? And I thought about it. In my mind, I was like, rap. Rap. I'd be a rapper. Before I spoke to I said, honestly, I can't do anything else. And, and my pastor at the time said, why? I said, because God has called me to this, and it's a burning in my bones. Like Jeremiah, like, I, I can't. I've pursued other things. Like, I can't. God has set a fire inside of me and I can't remove that. And he smiled and he said, typically if people say, 
If you could do anything else and you say that, he says, go do that, but don't be a pastor. It has to be a burning call from God, and you'll know it. Um, but anyways, it's not as honorable as you think. All that to say, and so here the Marites doesn't seem too honorable, but they get to serve the living God and what they offer. The temple couldn't function properly without their service. Imagine that. So when you sit out here and you think you offer nothing to the body, did you know if you guys didn't show up, there is no body. Even you just showing up, being faithful in that, that your presence makes this possible. Now those who were to camp before the tabernacle eastward before the tent of meeting toward the sunrise are Moses and Aaron and the and his sons, performing the duties of the sanctuary for the obligation of the sons of Israel. But the layman coming near was to be put to death. All the numbered men of the Levites, whom Moses and Aaron numbered at the command of Yahweh by their families, every male from a month old and upward, were 22,000. So 22,000 men of Levi are numbered. And it says Aaron and Moses and, and his sons, they camped on the eastward side. So we see all four sides of the tabernacle surrounded by the Levites. And when we further that out, we see the tribes on one of each of the four corners of the compass. And we saw last week, what did that create? A cross. Literally a cross full of people, like shaped this way, but when you number out how they're, they're functioned, was traveling through the desert in the shape of a cross with God centered in the middle. The Levites also make up part of that cross. Verse 40 then Yahweh said to Moses, Number every firstborn male of the sons of Israel from a month old and upward, and make a list of their names. You shall take the Levites for me. I am Yahweh, instead of all the firstborn among the sons of Israel and the cattle of the Levites, instead of all the firstborn among the cattle of the sons of Israel. So Moses numbered all the firstborn among the sons of Israel, just as Yahweh had commanded him, and all the firstborn males by the number of the names from a month old and upward, for their numbered men were 22,273. So we see a little bit of an overlap here, right? How many Levites were there? 22,000. How many firstborn of all Israel are here outside of Levi? 22,273. So there's that 273 extra of the firstborn of Israel. Well, God's going to make a, com uh, a compensation for that here at the end of the chapter. Then Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, take the Levites instead of all the firstborn among the sons of Israel and the cattle of the Levites and all the Levites shall be mine. I am Yahweh. For the ransom of the 273 of the firstborn of the sons of Israel who are in excess beyond the Levites, you shall take five shekels apiece per head. You shall take them in terms of the shekel of the sanctuary, the shekel is 20 girls, and give the money, the ransom of those who are in excess among them to Aaron and to his sons. So Moses took the ransom money from those who were in excess beyond the ransom, uh, I'm sorry, beyond those ransomed by the Levites from the firstborn of the sons of Israel he took the money in terms of the shekel of the sanctuary, 1,365 shekels. Then Moses gave the ransom money to Aaron and to his sons at the command of Yahweh, just as Yahweh had commanded Moses. So for the 273 extra, God says he's going to make an allowance for them to be somewhat redeemed or ransomed at five shekels a head. And then that money is given to Aaron and I have no clue what for. I was digging last night trying to figure it out and I'm like, doesn't say whether it was for his personal use or for the continuation of the tabernacle into the temple. He just says he gave it to Aaron. and Just like the Levites. The Levites were given to Aaron for his use. And God did designate specific things for them, but... Oof, I don't know if I should do chapter 4. We're already at an hour. I'll leave it up to you guys. You guys want to do it? It'll take me about 15 minutes or we can just push it off till next week. It's essentially going to say everything we just went through. That's why I was going to do chapter 3 and 4. Your guys is called so next week we could just do this again or I can spend 15 minutes and cover it right away. I'm going to let you guys make the call. Because it's everything we just said. God has a way of being repetitious. I'll leave it to your guys' call. Next week it is. Kurt spoke for you all. So... <laughs> Huh? The reason why is because there, there's stuff you could, if you wanted to go to, I think I got it all, but else. we'll see. Father, we thank you for being God. We thank you for your faithfulness, for your goodness, mercy, and grace. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, that you'd continue to move our hearts, Father, to do what is right before you in our daily lives, that we would treat you as holy, that we would walk in reverence before you, Lord. Help us not to take advantage 
or to take for granted, I should say, our, our times with you and your word, to not take advantage of our times in prayer, our times of worship, to not take advantage of your body, Lord. This is a precious thing that you allow us to do to gather together. And would it not be something that we just brush off to the side like it's nothing? Help us to revere you in all that we do, Lord. And as we do so, would you continue to build us up in the power and strength of your might, Lord? Cleanse our minds of the way we think, Lord. Change our thoughts that we would think like you. Our attitudes that we would reflect you. Our words that we would speak like you. And our actions that the world would know and see you in us. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for your faithfulness for this time again together in your name. We bless you. In Jesus' name.